Pantages, Chapter 2, Klondike Kate Klondike Kate had auburn hair, violet eyes, a shapely figure, and lived a tumultuous life that led her throughout North and South America, as she worked at jobs ranging from kindergarten teacher to chorus girl to dishwasher. She made her name and gained her fame and fortune on the saloon stages of Dawson in the Yukon, Canada, as a singer, dancer, and vaudeville star during the Klondike Gold Rush, where she earned her place in Gold Rush history as a beautiful, talented, and flirtatious stage dancer during Dawson's peak years, and met Alexander Pantages, who later became a very successful vaudeville motion picture mogul. Engaged more than a hundred times, married at least three times, and ever on the move, Kate thumbed her nose at the mores of her era, unashamed of who she was or the choices she made. She was born in Junction City, Kansas in 1873. Her given name, Kathleen Eloisa Rockwell. Her nickname, Kitty. Later in life, she would become known as Kate Rockwell Warner Matson Van Duren. She lived in North Dakota for a while, but grew up in Spokane, Washington. It's not surprising that Kate had a rebellious streak. Both of her parents defied Victorian standards by divorcing their first spouses to marry each other. A union that likewise ended in divorce when Kate was five years old. Five-year-old Kate's mother remarried once more to her divorce lawyer, Francis Bettis, a big attorney with showman skills who became a colorful politician and elected judge on circuit court. The family moved to Spokane, Washington. Her stepfather had stature in the community and the family lived in a large mansion until economic failures caused tension in the house. Kate grew up a tomboy and often played with boys rather than girls. She was known to say, it wasn't that I was bad, it was that I was full of life. Kate was a rebel, always playing hooky, running instead of walking. She was known as an independent spirit or a tomboy as a youngster, often impersonating boys and playing with them rather than with girls. She seemed a happy child, although she felt all too intensely the lack of social mobility for women in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. When Kate was eight years old, she saw firsthand dozens of people left homeless from a fire. So she invited 40 strangers to stay at her big house. What could her father say or do? He was a sitting judge, so he reluctantly obliged. Her father had a credit account at a local store that Kate used to buy food for a party with her friends without permission. As a young woman, Kate was beautiful and full of life, claiming throughout her life to have been born in 1880, 1882, and even 1892. She would say, my father showered luxury on me. How could anyone imagine that his beloved and indulged stepdaughter, who was being groomed to take her place as a society leader in the city, was destined to become a variety showgirl and a Yukon dance hall queen. Kate was expelled from a number of boarding schools because of her behavior. Kate loved to dance and flirt, especially with older men. To deal with Kate's rebellious nature, her parents sent the teenager to private boarding schools and convents from St. Joseph's in St. Paul, Minnesota to Snell Seminary in Oakland, California. But Rockwell either ran away or was expelled. She had little interest for education and spent more time thinking of ways to float the rules. When Kate was 15 years old, she was a shameless flirter who'd sneak off to country dances. Her stepfather's economic failure created tension in the family, and this lack of home stability echoed throughout Rockwell's sometimes stormy life. Her mother Martha found herself, again, divorced. Kate's stepfather moved to California, while their house was being sold to cover stock market losses, her mother operated a boarding house in Spokane. Kate's mother got $65,000 net from the sale of their house and decided to run away with it. Fleeing the gossips of Washington State, Martha took Kate with her to Valparaiso, Chile, where Martha's first husband's adult son was living. 
On the 87-day cruise, young Kate attracted the attentions of many a naval officer and to Martha's chagrin, even became engaged to the ship's first mate. This would be the first of countless marriage proposals that Kitty would receive. Upon landing in South America, Martha ended the engagement and promptly put Kate into a chaperone convent school. The effort did not deter Kate from accepting another marriage proposal, however, this time from a young diplomatic attaché from Spain. She said, I got a job teaching kindergarten in Valparaiso, Chile. A North American girl was a novelty. That's when I started getting my first proposals. I was just a kid and answered, see, to everything. Her mother followed a lover to London, abandoning Kate. Never one to miss a party, Kate spent her nights with boys in town and learned how to roll her own cigarettes. By 1891, Klondike Kate had seven engagement rings in her desk, and she was engaged to seven different good-looking South American amigos at the same time. When the school superintendent found out about it, Kate had to give all those rings back. Subsequently, she was kicked out of boarding school for singing and dancing in class. In short time, she had an unsuccessful attempt at show business. Her mother returned from England to the United States, and Kate soon joined her where they lived in New York City. After a hair-raising trip around Cape Horn and 97 days at sea, now 16 years old, Kate arrived in New York City to find her mother had squandered all their money and was about to seek work in a shirtwaist factory. Kate lived by a practical philosophy. She said, I believe it's better to be interested in what's coming around the corner, good or bad, than it is to moan about the present. I see so many persons in worse condition than I am. I feel that I am lucky and happy. And then, there's nothing like laughing your way through the world. After a few attempts to find a job as a store clerk or a model, Kate answered an ad and took the first of many jobs as a chorus girl. The ad said, Chorus girls wanted, no experience necessary. Kate was a natural. The job was brief, making her debut appearance as a page girl in a Coney Island bar. She said, Mother allowed me so many minutes to get dressed after my last act and enough time to ride home from Coney Island on a streetcar. Soon, she moved up, earning $18 a week, performing in vaudeville houses in New York. She met celebrities like Diamond Jim Brady and Lillian Russell, who gave her advice about showbiz. As Kate started out on the East Coast circuit, the company flopped, leaving her stranded in Pittsburgh and trying to hitch a ride home. She remembered those rough and rowdy times in a positive light, as giving her a taste of chorus girl life. Other chorus line jobs followed. In New York City, Kate took the name Kitty Phillips and got a job as a chorus girl in a variety theater. There, she got her first taste of what the job entailed. She said, I was told to sit in one of the boxes. An old schoolmate joined my table. Will you have a bottle of wine, he invited. Oh, no, thank you, I replied. I do not drink wine. I only drink lemonade. A bottle of wine cost $5, and the box waiter almost fainted. My commission would have been $1.25 a bottle. Later, one of the girls told Kate that between acts, she was expected to sit and drink with the customers on a percentage commission. Kate said, she also showed me how to pour the drinks into the spittoons when the customers were not watching. By 1892, Kate was 19, and she had become engaged long distance to 31-year-old Danny Allman, a minstrel star with a real gift for comedy, whom she had met in New York. By 1894, Kate now an experienced can-can dancer and soprano singer of tearful songs, heard from a former classmate in a variety theater back in Spokane, who invited her with a job offer to come work in a continuous vaudeville theater. Kate joined her friend Gertie Jackson and soon learned that singing and dancing were not the only job requirements. She also would be hustling drinks. As distasteful as it was, Kate stuck around to pay off her debts, and in time, she grew to enjoy the work. Professing shock and distaste, Kate learned to work customers after each show for a commission on drinks, although she stuck to lemonade. 
Kate was a good listener. By 1897, while living on dances and drink tips, Kate heard the first rumors of the Klondike Gold Rush. On the morning of July 17, 1897, headlines of the Seattle and Portland newspapers read, A ton of solid gold, off for the Klondike, a rush to the north, all daft over gold. Upon hearing the news of the gold rush, the mayor of Seattle and many police all quit and moved to the Klondike. In short order, Kate and fellow dancer Gertie Jackson quickly quit the Spokane show, resettled Kate's mother Martha in Seattle, and took off heading north, bound for greener pastures in the Yukon to start a sister act. Kate's fiance, Danny, the son of the mayor of Salem, Illinois, planned to join her, but before he could make it across country, she'd headed for Alaska. By the time the ship reached Skagway, however, Gertie developed cold feet and bowed out, heading back south. Kate stayed on and teamed up as a tap dancer with the Sonny Sampson Sisters Sextet, a fairly respectable troupe that enlisted piano-packing Klondike Mike Mahoney to accompany them. They performed six months in Soapy Smith's dingy, seedy honky-tonk, yet according to the press, retained their modesty and virtue. Kate Rockwell was in the right place at the right time when gold fever began its furious sweep across the United States, and she was captivated by it herself. She said, gold, 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 everybody talked about it, and Alaska, the Yukon, the North, I itched to go. In 1898, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police held a tight leash on prospective miners in various hangers-on, trying to get to the Yukon and find fortunes in gold. The Northwest Mounted Police interfered, stopping women from going down the Five Finger Rapids because it was considered too dangerous. Refused entry by a Mountie, Klondike Kate decided to press on, and in true Klondike Kate form, her account is, well, I was young and I didn't give a whoop, so I put on boys' clothing, waited until the scow was about to pull out, and jumped aboard just as the lines were being released from the bank. The Mountie saw me hit the deck, I should say hit the water, but I got a hold and was pulled on board. That Mountie bellowed orders at me, in the name of the Queen, and he was still fuming mad when we hit the rapids. He didn't get his woman. I waved at him as our square boat went into the seething froth of Whitehorse and Five Finger Rapids at 12 miles an hour. That man at the giant oar rudder muscled us through with great uncanny skill. Kate Scow headed to Whitehorse, where she gained notoriety for her flirtatious dancing and ability to keep hard-working miners happy, if not inebriated. She gathered up the gold thrown at her feet. She was a wealthy woman in those days. Kate Rockwell, known as Klondike Kate and Queen of the Yukon, brought grace and style to the dance halls and saloons of the Pacific Northwest. She said, I did the dance wearing a crown of candles for the first time in Juneau. I could have skipped rope and the men would have been just as appreciative. The saloon was called the Louvre, and it was the only place in town where you didn't have to entertain in the upstairs rooms. Kate recalled, that in 1899 in Whitehorse, a fine musician called the Little Parson played there just before Christmas. Kate was often their only entertainer and frequently played all night. Sometimes she made as many as 20 appearances. At Whitehorse, after a few months, a letter arrived inviting her to Victoria to join a burlesque and musical comedy troupe that was forming to entertain and to send on Dawson next year. The 173-member troupe, dancers, actors, singers, comedians, wardrobe, prop makers, makeup artists, seamstresses, stagehands, ragtime musicians, custodians, and the like, was being formed back in Victoria to play the Savoy in Dawson. But Kate was anxious to get to Dawson, so she set out to climb the Chillicut Pass with a man carrying a small piano. Unfortunately, she encountered another obstacle, the onset of winter. The Northwest Mounted Police would not permit women to go further, declaring it too dangerous. She was turned back at the border by the Mounties, who claimed the trail was too rugged for her, and she retreated to Skagway and headed southbound to Victoria. 
In 1900, Kate returned briefly to Victoria to join that Savoy theatrical company, a traveling song and dance 173-member theater troupe, and became a soubrette at the Savoy's Theater, a first-class vaudeville house where she developed two new song and dance acts each week. Owners Jack McDonald and Billy Jackson chaperoned her. She still planned to marry Danny Allman, but she took off his modest engagement ring and set to work at the Savoy. Nor did she seem distraught when Danny died of a brain hemorrhage later in November, but she saved his obituary and would treasure photos of him all her life. Kate finally arrived in Dawson in the spring of 1900 via steamship to find the town rebuilding after a disastrous fire, but with lively gold kings. She said, I shall never forget my first sight of Dawson, Front Street, Facing the Yukon was a solid line of saloons, dance halls, and gambling houses. In the first four months she was in Dawson, Alaska, Kate received a hundred proposals of marriage. Before long, she fell in love, and the only man she wanted to marry was young Greek Alexander Pantages, who in the end took her money to launch his career as a theater manager and broke her heart. First working as a tap dancer in Whitehorse, Klondike Kate found her stride in Dawson City as a member of the Savoy Theatrical Company. She said, The Savoy Theatrical Company had 173 members and was the largest company that ever went into the Klondike. We opened in 1900. Dawson at the time had just one of its disastrous fires and was being rebuilt. I was slightly disillusioned that the streets in Dawson were not made of gold, but there were men and how they did ogle. I gave them a little extra in my smile as we headed for the large two-story theater building that was to be as exciting to me as to the men who came in. Kate was known for subtracting five years from her age, and as a teenage performer, she was much loved by the miners. Although far from the best singer or dancer in Dawson City, Kate was a tireless and shameless self-promoter. Her legs were frequently bruised from being hit with gold nuggets thrown by miners. She occupied the star's room, which was trimmed in red and gold, upstairs over the theater. Kate worked as a dance hall girl throughout the Northwest before ending up in Dawson, where she soon discovered that money was nothing, just something to spend. Each dance cost a dollar, and I have dances as many as 183 dances in one night. We got to bed sometimes as late as eight or nine in the morning, she said. As for the gold dust that all but replaced currency in Dawson, Kate said, It was left in baking powder cans or pokes laying around in unlocked cabins, and you scarcely ever heard of a robbery. The Savoy, which had been closed by Dawson officials, reopened to a full house and good reviews. Kate, billed as a soubrette extraordinaire, was better trained than most in pleasing Klondike audiences from her grim days at Bennett. She wowed them wearing a rose-tinted, lace-trimmed gown embellished by a Lillian Russell hat with ostrich plumes, belting out throaty renditions of old ballads that sourdoughs loved. In a time when even showing a woman's ankle was considered risque, Kate wore ball gowns and daring costumes that not only exposed her ankles and legs, but her neck and shoulders as well. For Kate's first act at the Savoy, she wore a rose-tinted, lace-trimmed gown and an elaborate hat decorated with ostrich plumes. But it seemed that her incredible beauty and natural talent immediately set her apart from the rest of the girls. Kate soon caught the eye of a local promoter. Showman Arizona Charlie Meadows was impressed, not only with Kate's youth and talent, but what he discreetly described as her French flair. He immediately offered her more money and the star suite at his lavish Palace Grand Theatre, and she took it. Her new accommodations were prepared in red and gold with a red carpet, a bed, a rocking chair, a washstand, and a window overlooking the main street and the Yukon River. Kate loved it. Charlie Meadows recognized Kate's choreographic skills and, with his encouragement, she developed her trademark flame dance, a racy number in which she wore a red sequin dress trailing 200 yards of chiffon that she twisted and turned into an illusion of flames. She moved gracefully to the music in flashy costumes at a pace that kept about 
200 yards of chiffon airborne. The act launched her into Klondike stardom. For this number, she was paid $200 a week, and she claimed she often earned another $500 after each show. Between performances, she would dance with lonely miners for a dollar a dance, and drink champagne with them for which she received $7.50 a bottle. She said, sure, I was a percentage girl. We got 50% on dances and 25 on drinks. The commission on a pint of champagne was $7.50. My best night, I made $750, just for talking to some lonesome miner. A good entertainer was slow if she didn't cash in at least $100 worth of percentage checks every night. Dances were short and $1, and the man took his girl to the bar, if not a box, and splurged. Kate genuinely had a sympathetic ear. Her accounts of receiving huge sums for just listening to miners did keep a couple of depressed millionaires from suicide for which they gratefully rewarded her. She felt deeply committed when told a tale of woe. It became her own personal problem and she spent many sleepless mornings wrestling with the troublesome affairs of some raw-boned sourdough who was whipped to the point of cashing in his chips. She seemed to need many men constantly about her, lavishing their attentions on her, paying her compliments, and presenting her with tokens of affection. She soaked up this attention like a sponge seeking more and more, almost abnormally. She yearned to feel important and needed and loved. Kate made a fortune from the newly rich miners, sometimes earning more than $750 a night. She held miners spellbound with her flame dance and took their breath away when she appeared in a $1,500 French gown. Her lush ballads brought tears to their eyes and inspired a shower of gold nuggets. She said, we were vendors of laughter and music to men who were starved for beauty and gaiety, and we give good measure for all the gold the miners showered upon us. The most famous and beloved performer during the great Yukon Gold Rush, Klondike Kate, was famous for her red gold hair, charisma, and happy-go-lucky style on stage. She was also a spectacular conversationalist. Miners in town for an evening would chuck nuggets up on the stage and she'd scoop them up. She'd drink with them afterwards, sharing bottles of wine that cost five dollars each and pouring her glass discreetly into a spittoon to avoid getting drunk while they talked about their lives. She talked at least one miner out of committing suicide, talked several out of leaving their wives, and even staked a few with some cash to keep them going after they'd been cleaned out by a professional gambler or robbed. A wandering soul like himself and a prostitute soon. Pantages has worked his way up to pimp, selling the services of Klondike Kate and philandering himself. They became lovers as well as business partners. Life was good for Kate. Gold flowed freely through Dawson. Her lingerie was handmade in France and she wore only the most elegant expensive gowns. In spite of her numerous admirers and pleas from colleagues to concentrate on her dancing, Kate was completely focused on Pantages. Their days together were filled with laughter, dancing, and hard work. She said, we opened the Orpheum Theater together and it became the brightest spot north of the international boundary line. In the spring, we'd go picking poppies together on the banks of the Klondike and we'd make plans for the day when we would later marry. Kate had natural red hair, violet eyes, long black lashes, and a splendid figure. Her face was a delicate oval of innocence in marked contrast to her husky voice, her worldly experience and her blatant sexual appeal. Kate also had talent and grace, rare qualities among Dawson showgirls. Her special come on was something called the pixie stare, a projection of sweet innocence and raw sex that few men could resist. But it was her capacity for fun that ultimately won them. At least for the passing moment, she was tenderly loyal and sincere and she would demonstrate her feelings by grub staking a sourdough who was down on his luck or bringing hot soup to a stricken miner in his cabin. Ed Lung, a young miner and happily married man, struggled to explain the impact she had on him. Ed said, she was certainly very young, couldn't have been more than 19 or 20, she was actually 24. He went on to say, she had an appeal and winsomeness that was truly captivating. It was alluring, intangible, 
something, yes, difficult to describe. She was just a bit taller than average, eyes blue, complexion like peaches and cream. Her voice ranged from velvety soft to musical bells, and yes, she was sweet as honey. Well, impulsively, I reached into my hip pocket and drew out my small polka nuggets. How very hard I worked for that polka gold. Look at these yellow babies, I said eagerly. As I speak, the nuggets out in the palm of my hand, so that each shiny gold particle could show off its best advantage in the bright sunlight. They're beautiful, real gorgeous. Why, I've never seen such rare beauties. Say, did you get them all from your claim on Dominion Creek? Sure, I replied. Do you like them, Miss Rockwell? Then pick one out, I invited, and you can keep it. Oh, thank you, she exclaimed. Her lovely hands grasped, fondled, almost weighted each nugget. And then she chose my biggest one. This piece of gold will always remind me of you, Ed Lung, she said sweetly as she quickly opened her purse and dropped the shiny gold into a collection of many other nuggets. Yes, I think the one you gave me is the prettiest yet. Kate claimed to have accumulated more than $30,000 during her first year in Dawson, yet she insisted, I was never a gold digger. The men threw their gold at my feet when my dances pleased them. She never denied that she may have turned a trick or two to supplement those gold nugget showers. We were not vestal virgins, far from it, she said. Kate once famously performed singing and dancing until 3 a.m and couldn't remove her swollen feet from her shoes after. Never nude, colorful and timely, described the dancing that made Kate a legend in the Yukon, starting in white horse tap dancing, then burlesque and singing in Dawson, with sourdough serenading her with, let me call you sweetheart, while tossing gold nuggets at her feet, earning the nickname, the darling of Dawson. But Kate could afford to be discriminating and she was discreet, at least until she met a Greek Alexander Pantages, working as a swamper and waiter in Charlie Meadows' Monte Carlo. Pantages had started a stock company producing tear jerkers like Uncle Tom's Cabin and East Lynn. Pantages had a considerable nest egg when he wooed and won Kate Rockwell. After he got her to live openly with him, he invested in a cooperative stock company with Gussie Lamour and a number of other headliners like Beatrice Lorne, the Nightingale of the Yukon, who had a truly lovely voice. The Dawson Daily News reported on January 2, 1900 that Alex Pantages, the well-known porter at the Para House, has been selected as the manager to look after the general supervision of the house. Alex has been thrifty in his habits and has saved quite a poke, which he is willing to chance in the Dawson show business. The salaries of the performance have been placed on the same basis as during their last engagement, and any surplus is put into the general fund for contingencies. The intense love affair between Pantages and Rockwell became the stuff of legend in the Yukon. Although streaks of jealousy ensured that they found more stability in their professional lives than in their personal ones. They were not above swindling and cheating unsuspecting miners out of their gold and plying them with watered down champagne, a common practice in the Yukon. And this dubious quality eventually infected their own relationship. They were a team, waiter and dancer, relieving drunks of their gold dust in private boxes after the show. Pantages wasn't rich, and it was a stretch to call him handsome, but he lived and breathed theater, and his blinding drive to succeed was even stronger than Kate's. Scarcely taller than she, he had a swarthy complexion, a sensuous mouth, deep-set brooding eyes, and black hair with a patent leather shine. His barrel-chested body, of which he was inordinately proud, was graceful and well-muscled from years of hard labor. He was at least 25, but his father, a minor civil official, had altered records so that Pantages could avoid the draft. He never drank or smoked and was meticulously clean and clean-shaven, all features that made him stand out in frontier camp. He didn't talk much, perhaps because his English was ragged, but Kate found his accent charming. He couldn't read or write, but was fluent in several languages, and she guessed correctly that she would never meet anyone smarter. Soon Kate and Pantages were a couple, even openly living together in defiance of the social standards of the times. Kate continued as a headliner at the Monte Carlo, most memorably appearing at the Christmas Eve 1900 cake walk, wearing her $1,500 ivory satin gown designed by Worth of 
Paris. The patrons of the saloon had dubbed her the Queen of the Klondike at that all-night party, and she clung the name for the rest of her life. The miners fashioned a crown cut from a tin can with the edges cut into sharp points and stuck 50 flaming candles on the jagged points. The boys went wild as Kate danced with wax dripping into her hair, singing era songs. As Kate danced, wax dripped off the candles, covering her long braids. After many attempts to remove the wax from her hair, Kate decided to cut her hair into a bob, yet another moment of rebellion. That Christmas Eve also became special for Kate with the arrival of a Scandinavian miner named Johnny Matson. She called him a silent young Swedish fellow that would come every night religiously and watch me dance. Watching Kate dance that night, he instantly fell in love with her. The old sourdough carried the torch for Klondike Kate more than 30 years for her to return his love. Unfortunately for Matson, Pantages entered Kate's life at the same time. Later she would marry Matson, still in the Yukon, much of the time living and prospecting until his death. Charlie Meadows sold the Palace Grand for $17,000 and it was renamed the Subway. After the railway opened up, the pass heavy machinery was brought in and gold returns became the highest ever. This prompted everyone to bring their families to Dawson. Trump's sister, Louise, sold the property he gave her two years earlier for $250. In the winter following her departure from Monte Cristo, the town suffered some of the worst avalanches and floods in its short history. And this time, Rockefeller refused to reconstruct the almost vital railroad to Everett. In 1901, Pantages got fired for a failed hustle and before long persuaded Kate to join forces with him and to buy the small but successful established vaudeville and burlesque theater, the Orpheum. The first theater opened and operated by Pantages and Kate quit working as a dancer for Charlie Meadows to star in her lover's show. She became the principal performer. She supported Pantages for five years as he worked his way up in the theater. Klondike Kate owned the first vaudeville theater Pantages operated. There's reason to believe Kate bore Pantages' child during this period. After a brief absence to the States, she took care of an infant, explaining that it was the child of the pregnant girl that was dying of tuberculosis whom she had befriended, who had died giving birth. She later placed her child with foster parents in the States. Kate's lover had become the focus of her life. She said, Alex Pantages and I laughed, danced, and worked hard during those months at the old Orpheum. We opened it together and it became the brightest spot north of the international boundary line. In the spring we go picking poppies together on the banks of the Klondike and we make plans for the day when we would later marry. Pantages may not have been able to read or write, but he could speak several languages and he was particularly adept at figures. Pantages assumed management of Klondike Kate's theatrical enterprises and operated the Orpheum Vaudeville Theater in partnership with her. The productions Pantages staged in Dawson filled his pockets with the gold of miners eager for entertainment. When Pantages' cooperative stock company failed, Kate kept him in 75 cent cigars and $15 silk shirts and spent $45 a week on meals for him. Her friend Gertie declared publicly that Kate was plum crazy to fall so hard for a foreign patent leather kid who will love her, take her gold, and leave her. But Pantages' venture with the Orpheum paid off, grossing about $8,000 a day. And by all accounts, Kate was never happier. She said, I began my day's work with an hour in the gymnasium to keep trim. Then I would take my own dog team and go lashing out over the frozen snow. I had my own horse, and in the summer I'd drive like wild through the strangely beautiful country. Then, there was gold in the streets of Dawson, gold in the hills, and gold in the Yukon and I was named the queen of it all. All my lingerie was French and handmade. My dresses were covered in rhinestones and seed pearls and spangles and sequins. By August 1901, gambling was abolished in Dawson. Then prostitution was abolished and moved to Klondike City. Kate and Pantages took a scouting expedition to Nome, which neither found it enticing. While managing Kate's hard-earned money, Pantages opened a theater, The Oaks, in Nome, 
where he was able to fetch $12.50 a ticket. Very high for those days, but commensurate with prices in a boomtown economy. Here Pantages met his future wife, Lois Mendenhall, who was playing violin on the circuit there. By the 1890s, growth in the railroad industry allowed performers to travel quickly across the country from town to town. Shrewd theatrical producers now had the ability to develop a nationwide network of theaters and encouraged performers to travel on a circuit that connected these theaters, creating a unified national popular culture. Theater owners also drew upon a growing culture of advertising, which allowed lithographs and broadsheets to be posted cheaply and quickly and often focused primarily on promoting theatrical productions. These promotional tools helped stir demand for a national popular culture, a demand that proved so great even smaller communities lacking access to the drawing power of a major theater could still hope to attract imitators of well-promoted star performers. Thrifty theater owners like Pantages, who noted that such imitators would work for a lower price than genuine headliners, enthusiastically embraced this practice. These nationwide theater circuits formed the organizational basis of vaudeville, the most popular entertainment of the early 20th century. Pantages would grow from here to become the biggest. Not only watching his audience intently to figure out what they wanted, but after hours he was sweeping the floors and sifting out the gold dust. Fire gutted Pantages Theater three times. Each time he rebuilt, but when gold was discovered at Nome, business slowed in the Yukon Territory. He was playing for high stakes and he seldom made a move without seeing dollars at the end of the trail. While he could be ingratiatingly servile, he was insolent, indifferent, and taciturn to many who knew him. He rarely smiled and was seldom heard to laugh, for he lacked an open sense of humor, and often treated people coldly. His mind worked in dollar signs, which was all the reading knowledge he needed for getting ahead in this land of gold. This was a side of her lover that Kate had not observed, or perhaps had ignored, because his drive was an asset in her own quest for wealth and fame. Frederick Trump, Donald Trump's father and his business partner, Levin, broke up their business relationships in February, but reconciled in April. Around that time, the local government announced suppression on prostitution, gambling, and liquor, though the crackdown was delayed by businessmen until later that year. In light of this impending threat to his business operation, Trump sold his share of the restaurant to Levin and left the Yukon. Back in Whitehorse, Levin got into landlord troubles with someone who didn't actually own the land anyway and lost control of the Arctic in 1902. After a hotel orgy and jewelry theft, a running mate who would have embarrassed a Trump, not the other way around. Frederick Trump sold his assets and decided to go back to Germany when police started cracking down on his criminal rackets. While one could argue that Trump made the decision because he believed that police were going to start enforcing prostitution laws, that's only one factor that led to Trump's departure for Germany. Frederick Trump saw that it was time to leave. If Major Wood actually enforced the laws regarding prostitution, gambling, and liquor, hotels and restaurants would be far less profitable. Not only that, the economic boom was about to be short-lived. There was not nearly enough solid economic development to absorb these newcomers in any long-term way. When the placer deposits were emptied, they would go back home. Without the umbrella of gold, other local industries would not be strong enough to keep going on their own and compete with cheaper sources farther south. The boom was over, Frederick Trump realized. So he left just in time. He avoided the uproar when his erstwhile partner hit the skids, and he avoided the economic decline that it would soon sweep over White Horse. Once again, in a situation that created many losers, Trump managed to emerge a winner. He had made money, Perhaps even more unusual in the Yukon, he had also kept it, and departed from Whitehorse with a substantial nest egg. He had accomplished this goal of making and saving enough money to marry, but he had no intention of doing so in America. For this important moment, he would have to return to Germany. In the months that followed, Levin was arrested for public drunkenness and sent to jail, and the Arctic was taken over by the Mounties. Trump returned to Germany his hometown, Kallstadt, as a wealthy man. The business of seeing to his customers' need for food, drink, and female companionship had been good to him. He quickly met and proposed to Elizabeth Christ, daughter of a neighbor, she was 11 years younger than Trump, being five years old when he originally had left the village. 
Trump's mother disapproved of Christ because she considered her family to be of a lower social class. This was a Trump who knew when to quit. The 1901 Canadian census counted 27,000 Yukon residents, more than Vancouver had at the time. A decade later, the territorial population plunged by two-thirds. In Seattle, on the morning of Tuesday, June 25, 1901, John Considine dropped by a lawyers to inform them that if his client Meredith would not retract the claim about Mamie Jenkins, he was ready to sue for libel. He and his brother Tom wandered down from the lawyer's First Hill neighborhood and dropped by the courthouse, hoping to sort out business's legal problems. The prosecuting attorney was out. At the courthouse, a friend warned him that Meredith was after him and advised him to arm himself. Considine went about his day, dropping by the office to read his mail, deciding to knock off early because of a sore throat, shooting some pool with his brother. Forewarned, he picked up a 38 revolver that normally remained at work. Meanwhile, Meredith had acquired a virtual arsenal. Besides a shotgun, which he had wrapped in butcher paper, he was carrying a 32 Colt in a 45 frame and a 38 caliber short barreled revolver. He had also placed silver dollars strategically around his vest, presumably for armor. He spoke openly of the town not being big enough to hold both him and Considine. Meredith waited at the corner of Yesler and Occidental, where he expected the Considines would go to catch the streetcar back up the hill. He spotted the Considines headed into Geo Guy's drugstore, a block to the east, where John meant to pick up something for his throat. They were standing just outside the store talking with one patrolman, Murford, who Meredith had suspended for pocketing part of a protection payment earmarked for Meredith himself. Meredith caught up to them just outside the store, took point-blank aim at John Considine with his shotgun, and missed. The dazed Considine staggered into the store. Tom Considine and Merford were so taken aback that they hardly reacted at first. Meredith entered the store pursuing John Considine. Meredith's neck shot caught the back of Considine's neck, wounded the arm of a messenger boy drinking a sarsaparilla at the soda fountain, and nearly caught Dr. Guy, who hit the floor. Meredith dropped the shotgun and went for the revolver. Considine managed to grab Meredith in a bear hug and drag him toward the entrance, yelling out for help from his brother, who finally realized what was happening. Tom grabbed Meredith's gun and smashed it into Meredith's skull. More police arrived, including Sheriff Cudahy. Tom grabbed one of their guns and drew down on them, yelling, Stand back, you sons of bitches! Meanwhile, John Considine drew his gun on Meredith, who was clearly wounded but still moving and reaching for another weapon. Considine shot Meredith three times in the chest and neck, killing him, then handed his gun to Sheriff Cudahy and surrendered himself. While Meredith had always been part of the Open Town faction, his death made him a martyr for the Closed Town side. At the Considine's trial, the prosecution tried to make the case that the Considines had started the gunfight. However, Meredith's outspoken statements in the 24 hours before the fight, including, they couldn't get a jury in King County that would convict me for killing Considine, helped to clarify any confusion as to what happened as did the testimony of the best situated eyewitnesses. The jury took only three hours to reach an acquittal. Pantages, the Greek entrepreneur, had set his sights on creating a national theater chain. He moved to Seattle to begin working on it. Various accounts gave Kate's worth at the time at $100,000, which was probably overblown, for she stayed in Dawson to work after Pantages left. Briefly, Kate and Pantages reopened the Orpheum. But the Mounties busted Kate for operating a body house and she was sentenced to one month of hard labor. After she was released, she went on a holiday with Pantages, ending up in Seattle herself and running some Nickelodeons. The new hand-cranked novelty flickers along with vaudeville acts with Kate as a star. During the early 1900s, Railway workers were active in campaigning for better wages, with boilermakers striking in 1902. As train tracks now crossed the country, workers became increasingly mobile and moved often to find better employment and wages, often with the seasons. 
In this world of uncertainty, the definition of race took on unprecedented importance and led to increasing focus on the racial categorization of immigrants who were feared as a source of poverty, crime, political corruption, and social subversion. By the early 1900s, immigration had been termed a problem with illiteracy seen as a major contributing factor, leading to increased calls for immigrant restriction and expanded Americanization programs. Vaudeville performances also demonstrated currents that were shared by more than just the middle class, encompassing the urban lifestyle of millions of Americans. Variety performances identified urban problems and suggested ways of coping with them. With efficiency and discipline, the key to both a successful performance on stage and a successful life in the city. Vaudeville humor, which often boiled down to laughing at others and their suffering rather than with them, suggested a difficulty in finding intimacy with the numerous strangers one encountered in daily city life, while also providing a feeling of superiority. Yet comedy was not just slapstick, but regularly observed the inefficiency of government and the paradoxes facing an unsophisticated immigrant populace, which provided an outlet for their audiences when they supplied laughs on subjects which were sensitive and unsolvable. Songs such as Give My Regards to Broadway, Hello Central Give Me Heaven, and The Man Who Broke the Bank in Monte Carlo, through their titles alone, spoke to the joy and loneliness of urban life, glorifying success and teaching urban etiquette. Magicians and spiritualists occasionally presented themselves as mysterious masters of the occult, but performers such as Houdini urged audiences instead to look beyond these homespun traditions, fostering the primacy of science over spiritualism. Even animal acts demonstrated a fault line in the struggle between Darwinian evolutionists and sentimentality. In short, virtually every act on the vaudeville stage, directly or indirectly, was influenced by modern urban American life and the problems it posed. By the end of the 1890s, it was no longer common for performers to approach their work with the belief that they must educate their audience. Instead, favoring the assumption that the audience would bring their own knowledge to the performance. As the incentive for performers to serve as educators declined and the drive towards entertainment accelerated, vaudeville no longer made an effort to be intellectually engaging. And as a result, the cultural fair that was actively and regularly shared by all segments of the population belonged ipso facto to the lower rungs of the cultural hierarchy. The effect of vaudeville's refusal to engage in anything beyond popular entertainment for the masses, where social issues and original drama would appeal to the intellect, vaudeville maintained a hands-off policy. In effect, vaudeville retarded the intellectual growth of the nation. Vaudeville was a mirror image of its public, reflecting a country that was evidently content to be socially and intellectually mediocre. Vaudeville quickly came to be dominated by performers catering their acts towards very broad audiences. Producers became reluctant to book acts that could be considered highbrow, fearing that it would cut into profits, and led producers to look down on their audiences. As a result, vaudeville, despite being an entertainment for the masses, came to occupy a middle rung in an emerging cultural hierarchy, below legitimate theater productions, but above forms such as burlesque that catered to a niche male audience. While it was nearly impossible for small-time theater owners to hire major stars, they often hired impersonators that offered to perform popular acts for a much lower price. Small-time vaudeville theaters had been incorporating films into their bills since their openings. A cheaper alternative to booking live performers, films could be used by newer struggling theaters to help pad out short bills and make them into a greater spectacle. Klondike Kate had fallen in love with Alexander Pantages, who borrowed significant sums of money from her to launch his career as a theater manager. But Kate had fallen in love with the magic of the Klondike Rush itself, partying and drinking on an increasingly lavish scale, and she was shocked when Pantages suggested they leave in the spring of 1902. Leave, she echoed, and miss all the excitement? There isn't another place like this in the world, and I love it. Pantages talked her into spending her savings on a grand tour that included New York City, a visit to her mother. She followed Pantages back to Washington, 
where he abruptly booked her on a tour in the boom towns of Texas. In Seattle, with money taken from his time with Klondike Kate, Pantage's first move was to open a combination fruit store and shoeshine parlor across the street from a Sullivan and John Considine house, where he worked as a boot black. Having at least three women calling themselves Klondike Kate by the early 1900s, two known as professional prostitutes does confuse. But Pantages Kate was the original. A redhead with curves to die for, Klondike Kate dressed in Parisian gowns and expensive jewelry. The headliner everywhere she went, yet also admired for offering a kind ear to a miner's sob story. Pantages lovingly called Kate our destitute prostitute and sent her to Texas for a year to perform and make money. While Kate went to Texas to dance, she deserted Pantages briefly for an interlude with a gambler who did not treat her well. The human stampede that followed news of gold discoveries fell to a trickle. By 1902, it was a memory. As the boom subsided, the miners left. Pantages claimed he was making $3,000 a day for four years, but the half million dollars he made was finally lost in bad deals. With the remaining $4,000, Pantages left Dawson and relocated to the lumberjack town of Seattle, Washington, settling in to create a national theater chain.